When Donald Trump won the presidency in 2016, many Democrats were baffled as to what went wrong. But a new book purports to have the key to the problem and the solution. Dirt Road Revival lays out the roadmap for how Democrats can rebuild rural politics and why the authors believe the party's future depends on it. The pair behind it join me now, Chloe Maxman was the first Democrat ever elected to represent her district when she joined the State House in 2018, also making history as the youngest female state legislator in Maine's history, going on to beat the incumbent Senate Minority Leader in 2020, and Canyon Woodward was her campaign manager through it all. Welcome to both of you. Thanks so much for joining me. First, I want to set the table a little bit. Can you, can you tell me what flavor Democrats you are? If someone were to ask you what kind of Democrat you are, what would you say? I think we're we're progressive young folks who grew up in in rural conservative communities, and we really love where we're from, and we also really love the progressive movement and the Democratic Party and, and all that it stands for. I I don't know if we have all the answers, but we certainly learned a lot on the campaign trail in our districts, and that's what the book is about. And Kenyon, it's important to note you you're not people who have just swooped in. Uh, to Maine or just swooped in from the big city to share your expertise. You're both born and bred in rural areas, right? Yeah, that, that, that's right. I grew up in a, in a super rural part of Southern Appalachia and, and we both, yeah, we both spent our whole lives being, being raised by these communities and, and felt the call back very strongly. So I'm old enough to remember Dale McCormick, uh, who was uh, a Maine um, state treasurer. She was also, I think she's now a city councilor, an openly lesbian uh, person who went campaigning in, in Maine and uh, actually ran for Congress and almost won. And during her campaign, I remember speaking with her and her sharing with me the interaction she had while she was campaigning across the state. Uh, both uh, when she was uh, a state representative and as well as running for Congress. Um, Chloe, can you share with me what some of the interactions you have had while you've been campaigning that might not be fitting with what some people think rural voters are, are, are concerned about or caring about? Sure thing. Yes, yes, I know of Dale and know we we both come from from movements that have a long and proud history and also are organizing right now with so many people doing incredible work in rural communities. And you know what, what we found in, in our campaigns as we talked with so many Republicans and independents who had never been contacted by a Democratic candidate or canvasser in their entire voting history, you know, we found a lot of common ground and we would have Trump signs next to Chloe signs and and, and, just, and just had incredible conversations that changed my perspective as a progressive person, really understanding um, folks who think differently than me, which is, which is really okay. You know, that's, that's a part of what makes this country so great. And it was, it was uncovering that common ground that was, that was really, really hopeful and just kind of a, a, a wake up call of, of how much work we, we have to do across the country. What is some of that common ground, Chloe? If someone has a Trump sign up and a sign up for you, um, where, where do you overlap on things that you care about and the constituent cares about? You know, I found so much common ground on on many many issues. You know, I I can't remember talking to a single Republican who wanted healthcare to be more expensive. And on a higher level, I found so much empathy and and just shared understanding of a frustration with our political system and how much I, as a young person, and and these folks in in rural conservative places, just really feel like government has let us down. You know, on on, on every level, and that's why I ran for office and I found that that shared solid with the folks that I was talking to as well. Kenyon, uh, from the organizing and the campaign standpoint, in the, in the book, you, you guys write a lot about, um, you know, we're, and we're going to get into it in just a second, but what the Democrats should be doing in, in order to stay engaged with these rural voters and hopefully uh, get them to vote for them. But one of the challenges, I think, is the numbers game, right? And um, I think Democrat campaign managers and candidates will say, look it, I can spend my time in a big city, in a bigger city, in a town, with a number of residents that I think I can get to vote for me, or I can go work and try and get rural voters uh, who I have to go and spend a lot of time to try and talk them into me. Why, why not go, you know, as they say, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Why not 
stay with the, the city and urban folks to, to get, the, get into office, what's the cost at doing that for the Democratic Party? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's certainly a whole lot easier to, to pay for TV ads in a big metropolitan market than it is to invest that money in grassroots organizing. But, but the cost is really steep. You know, if, um, if you're only concerned about the statewide vote, then squeezing as many votes as possible out of the most populous areas um, might make sense, but it's at the cost of losing state legislatures and sending overwhelmingly Republican delegations to, to Congress like like we have in my home state of North Carolina where we have a Democratic governor but Republican super majorities and, and an overwhelmingly Republican um, Congress delegation. So Chloe, what's, what's, what's your advice to the Democratic Party? Um, how, how do they change focus that they have, I mean, it was clear from the Hillary Clinton loss, and it, I don't think that it's gotten any better, that ignoring, you ignore the rural voter at your own peril. Um, have they gotten better at paying attention to rural voters? Uh, and if not, what should they be doing? Well, there's certainly a lot of folks all across the country, rural progressives, rural young folks who are running for office and winning and having these conversations. And that's that's so exciting and really should should be honored. You know, we stand beside all the incredible rural organizers in this country and we need a lot more. And, and it sounds so simple, but the heart of it is really just having conversations with people. I think things are so divisive these days and, and so complicated. I don't know of a way to, to overcome that and build a relationship that, that's worthy of a vote, which is a really sacred thing, unless we go door to door and just have an honest conversation with people. Um, you, you write a bit about um, how suspect the rural voter is, um, not just of the, the Democratic Party, but of the Republican Party as well. What, what do the parties, what do the elected officials and the candidates need to do in order to be engaged with the rural voter and the rural citizens? I think it's, I think it's, you know, oh. it's really about, it's really about gra back to grassroots organizing. We, we have to go and have face-to-face -face conversations. We, we canvass so much in the cities and suburbs and people are honestly tired of it. Whereas if you drive down that dirt road and find these folks that we've been talking to for the last several years, so many of them say, I've never been contacted by a democratic campaign or any politician ever before in, in my life. And that conversation means so much more. Um, so we really have to invest in, in building out that, that grassroots infrastructure. Chloe, can you touch on it a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can expand on um, the issue. We, we, and I think that the operatives and politicos and, and those of us who cover it sometimes break down the federal lawmakers and then local, and, and we separate them. But, you know, as we're seeing certainly with the potential of the reversal of Roe v. Wade and the vote today uh, with senators not codifying Roe v. Wade into a federal law, um, we have a big imbalance in, in the country with the number of people who are represented, represented by some senators and then others who are not, and that the state lawmakers um, who are regularly conservative and Republican are the ones who are going to be calling the dance card as we move forward. How, what's the connection there between connecting with rural voters that will have an impact on national and federal lawmaking? It's, you know, it's really all connected. And, and I think it's it's a connection that's becoming more and more prominent these days. But, you know, there is so much power in state legislators, legislatures. But, you know, over the during Obama's presidency, the Democrats lost almost a thousand legislative seats nationwide. And in that in that same time span, rural voters went from a nonpartisan voting preference to a 16 point Republican advantage. So there's been a wild swing. And the consequence of that is more influence on the national level and at the state level as well. And so Democrats have really kind of lost ground in some of the key races that, that we've historically relied on. And like Canyon says, with the example of North Carolina, if you have a Democratic governor, but a Republican legislature, the issues that we care about from reproductive rights to climate justice to racial justice, we are not going to advance these, these extremely vital 
important policy causes unless we have good Democrats in office. Kenyon, the, the narratives about uh, rural voters, um, which which you write about in the book also, is, you know, that they they vote against their own best interests. You know, you've got some of the poorest counties and poorest states uh, voting for Republicans who are turning around and not helping them not be poor anymore. Or uh, you quote the, the, the Hillary Clinton quote about uh, a, a basket full of deplorables, and you note the Barack Obama, you know, clinging to their guns, uh, and, and this really dismissive view that not just Democrats, but Republicans too, but we're talking about Democrats, have about the rural voters. How can something that seems so steeped in the narrative of our nation, how can you get Democrats to, to change that thought process? Yeah, I, I think it's hard. I think, I think that we need to hear more stories out of rural c communities and from rural campaigns. I, it's, it's frustrating to, to see folks voting for for Donald Trump, and and it's I think it's a natural human reaction for for folks to kind of other make people into the other who disagree with them, um, and it's just it's just about fighting back against those stereotypes and against those narratives, and and changing the messaging to lead to lead with values and the significant common ground that we do have when we get out of the Twitter sphere, get out of our. Facebook feeds and, and Fox News and just have a face-to-face -face conversation. Chloe, in the book, you guys, you know, you, you, it's a how-to book as well. It's not just a what happened, but it's also a how-to for folks who are interested in um, uh, running for office, but also for Democrats uh, to read. Um, what's, what's your take on what has to happen right now? We seem to me, at least from my viewpoint, to be in a really awful position when it comes to protecting our democracy and getting people involved in voting. Um, what, what would be your advice to someone considering running for office right now who's motivated by the need to protect, protect the democracy? There's, there's no question the stakes have never been higher. And, you know, there's, there's so many lessons that we've extracted from our work and what work, what works in Maine may not work in other places, but I think one of the, the common themes that we've had in our campaigns and our work in Maine and in other states is the vital importance of talking to people and not just the people who already agree with us, but the folks who might think about the world a little bit differently than we do. We can't keep just relying on, on, uh, on having folks with the same letter next to their name vote for us. We need a broader movement that's more durable, more sustainable, more reflective, more inclusive. We're only going to do that if we have face-to-face -face conversations. It's a long process. It's a it's a painstaking process, and it's a hopeful process. But I also think it's very necessary. Can you? What happens when people get elected? That um, you know, I was I was shocked at uh, about how how some elected officials, especially on the federal level, seem completely disconnected by how inflation is impacting. All families of on every every rung on the economic ladder, you are feeling um, the inflation. And uh, as an issue for the midterm election for the Democrats to actually win, it's something that even though there's not a lot of president can do about it, I would be out talking about it every day. What happens when they get elected that they forget that they actually, you know, are talking to people who have to pay their bills every day? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't have the answer answer for that, but you know, I, I mean, I think you look at the makeup of of Congress. You look at the makeup of our state legislatures, and um, they're overwhelmingly wealthy or retired, you know, old white men. And we need to change that. We need more more people like Chloe, more young women, more people of color in office, more working class folks. Um, who, who aren't just getting there because they're independently wealthy and have funded funded their own campaigns. Yeah, that's a whole other chapter in your book, which we can get to. And Chloe, I would imagine your advice to folks would be that step toward people who are different from you and disagree with you rather than step away from them? Yeah, embrace the difference. There's, there's so much power in agreeing to disagree and even just understanding where someone else is coming from, even if they're not going to vote for you. All right, Chloe Maxman, Canyon Woodward, thank you so much for joining me. I enjoyed the book, and I recommend it for everyone to read it right now, especially as we are in this dangerous time. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much.